It's not just about voting in November. It's about doing everything in our power to protect and help vulnerable people access abortion across state lines. And we have to raise hell in our cities, in Washington, in every restaurant just as Alito eats at for the rest of his life. It wasn't Justice Alito, but Justice Kavanaugh, who was first to experience the kind of dinner table demonstration Samantha Bee talked about on her show Full Frontal. The beer-loving associate justice who voted to take reproductive rights away from millions of Americans had, at least for one night, his right to a peaceful meal, dare say a right to privacy, taken away. Politico was first to report the incident at Morton Steakhouse in DC, downtown D.C., quote, while the court had no official comment on Kavanaugh's behalf and a person familiar with the situation said he did not hear or see the protesters and ate a full meal but left before dessert, Morton's was outraged about the incident. Dessert courses aside, we know the conservative supermajority on the court isn't ready to stop at abortion. When the decision on Roe came down, Justice Clarence Thomas made it clear in a concurring opinion that the justices, quote, should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents. He then listed decisions that legalize the right to obtain contraception, the right to same-sex intimacy, and the right to same-sex marriage. And smart people are taking notice of that, including my next guest, NYU constitutional law professor Kenji Yoshino. His latest New York Times op-ed is headline, Is the Right to Same-Sex Marriage Next? And yes, even comedians like Samantha B are taking notice of, of it. I can't describe how painful it is to be here now in a place where the Supreme Court has the power to erase 50 years of constitutional law. Make no mistake, this is not where it ends. Conservatives will not rest until they have come for all of our rights. Everything we have fought for could be lost unless we take it back. Joining me now is Kenji Yoshino, professor of constitutional law at NYU Law School and the director of NYU's Center for Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging. It's been a long time, Professor. Great to see you again. Great to in, see you as well, Jonathan. In your piece, you wrote, Justice Samuel Alito's majority opinion is at pains to say that nothing in this opinion should be understood to cast doubt on precedents that do not concern abortion. Yet that statement rings false. Kenji, I didn't believe it when that language appeared in the leaked draft. Why does it especially ring false now? Well, I mean, to start with the draft itself, this is just not how adjudication works. If you announce a test, and that test perforce applies to future cases before the court, the test that Samuel Alito articulated for the majority in Dobbs was that unenumerated rights will not be protected unless they are deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. Now, last time I checked, the right to same-sex marriage, the right to contraception, the right to same-sex sexual intimacy, none of these were deeply enshrined in the nation's history and traditions. So it's just a QED, it's just a matter of logic that underneath that test, these precedents are freshly in peril. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever I raise this, Jonathan, I get accused of fear-mongering in many quarters. Whenever I say, oh, or Burgerfell is next, or Lawrence is next, people say, well, you know, Justice Thomas is a crank, he's an outlier, he doesn't really know what he's saying. And I would say a couple of things to that. One is, he knows exactly what he's saying. He is speaking to a country in ways that he has done in previous cases, like Second Amendment cases, inviting litigation where he wants litigation yep. to occur, right? So to dismiss him as an outlier is simply false. And as you say, in the days since Dobbs, we've actually seen people take up that call to arms. So whenever I'm arguing against somebody who is usually not deeply embedded in the LGBT litigation community, say I'm fear-mongering, I sort of don't know whether or not to be sort of hopeful or uh, pessimistic, right? Because uh, all I need to do is wait, and then the other shoe will drop. So in fact, in the midst of having one of these arguments with a colleague, uh, Ken Paxton, the Texas Attorney General, announced that he would be willing to uh, have Lawrence reconsidered and would defend a sodomy statute if one were to be reenacted. So this is the 2003 Lawrence case, often seen as the Brown versus Board of Education of the LGBT rights movement, that is now freshly on the chopping block and people are taking up that invitation that Justice Clarence Thomas calmly issued in his concurrence. 
And the Lawrence case is Lawrence v. Texas, so it's it, you know the, the the symbolism there is is heightened. I want to pick up on something that that you said. Also, Professor Yoshida, Yoshida when I read the draft, the Alito draft, I immediately wrote a column saying, "Yo." Obergefell is in danger. If you just the logic, you take away Roe and the right to privacy, where does that leave where does that leave Obergefell? But I want to pick up on something you just said that Justice Thomas is inviting litigation. But do you also buy the contention that he's also sending a signal to those conservative judges in lower courts, many of whom clerked either for him or justices on the Supreme Court that hey, I'm inviting litigation, and then when that litigation gets to you, y'all know what to do. That's exactly right. And so, again, for those who would say he's a voice crying out in the wilderness, in the wilderness that may have been true about, you know, 10 years ago, but people need to update their disks. Under the Trump presidency, the lower courts were filled with jurists who, as you say, were, if not former clerks of Justice Thomas, at least fellow travelers and the Federalist Society who are going to be very, very attentive to uh, the kind of breadcrumbs that he drops in these concurrences. One more question for you, um, Professor. With Justices Alito, Barrett, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh and Thomas all seemingly to the right of him, has Chief Justice John Roberts, in effect, lost control of the Supreme Court? Absolutely. I mean, we saw that in the Dobbs opinion himself, where he was actually uh, not a member of the court who joined the majority. And he was actually waving his hands at the majority, saying, you're doing too much too fast. Like, you can actually strike down, uh, actually, rather, you can uphold the Mississippi statute without actually doing anything to Roe, uh, because you can say that uh, there's enough time for the woman to make a decision or the pregnant person to make a decision in the 15 weeks that uh, Mississippi law affords it. So he was saying, just, you know, uphold this particular law. Don't do anything to uh, Roe or to Casey other than adjusting the viability line. Uh, but he lost on that one. And so this kind mm -hmm. of maximalist, very aggressive uh, court sort of run roughshod over him. And that five-member majority that you just uh, named is now uh, holding the reins. So he's really the chief justice in name only.